Okay, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Wa salatu wa salam ala al-ma'uth rahmatil al-alameen. Nabina wa habibina Muhammadin sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallim. Amma ba'd. Today, I guess, uh, 5th of uh, November, uh, 2021. Bidillahi ta'ala, I will uh, be with uh, you uh, speaking about this uh, noble and important topic which is about the importance of uh, the prayer. Uh, once again, uh, thank you very much, uh, the Islamic Society of uh, the University of Nottingham. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward you abundantly. And uh, really happy to be on your uh, platform uh, from time to time. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant all of you success and uh, put barakah in, in your life. So, insha'Allah, I will begin with this uh, uh, topic, starting from what happened in the, in the future when we move out of this life back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, awwalu ma yuhasabu alayhi al-abdu as-salah. The first thing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will judge a person when he meets him on the day of judgment is the prayer. If the prayer is okay, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, فَقَدْ أَفْلَحَ وَأَنْجَحَ So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, the first thing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will question you about it concerning the matters of religion on the Day of Judgment is, is the prayer. The Day of Judgment, you know that this is a day that everyone is waiting for. There is no way for a person to escape this. The poet says, وَلَوْ أَنَّا إِذَا مِتْنَا تُرِكْنَا لَكَانَ الْمَوْتُ رَاحَةَ كُلِّ حَيٍّ وَلَكِنَّا إِذَا مِتْنَا بُعِثْنَا وَنُسْأَلُ عِنْدَهَا عَنْ كُلِّ شَيْءٍ He says, if the issue is about we live in this life and that will be the end of it, he says, death is going to be the resting place for every, every, every living one. Yeah, because, you know, the tragedy of this life and the calamity of this life and uh, if the issue is about you dying and that the case is closed, then alhamdulillah, death is going to be the, the moment of rest for everyone. But the issue is not like that. A person will be caused by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to die. And then he will be taken back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for accountability. In Surah to al Imran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Kullu nafsin da'iqatul mawt. وَإِنَّمَا تُوَفَّوْنَ أُجُورَكُمْ يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ فَمَنْ زُحْزِحَ عَنِ النَّارِ وَأُدْخِلَ الْجَنَّةَ فَقَدْ فَازْ وَمَا الْحَيَاةِ الدُّنْيَا إِلَّا مَتَعُ الْغُرُورِ Allah says, every soul shall taste death. And this confirmed that which the poet says, that everyone is going to taste the death. And the rest of the ayah also confirm it properly. Where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَإِنَّمَا تُوَفَّوْنَ أُجُورَكُمْ يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ So there is no way, you know, no way that a person can escape death. You will die. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, إِنَّكَ مَيِّتُونَ وَإِنَّهُمْ مَيِّتُونَ You will die and they will also die. If death took the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, for sure it would take any other person who is lower than the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And there is nobody in the same position with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So he died as a clear and indirect message to everyone. that There is no way for you to escape death. It has to come. That's part of the process. And the system that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala prescribed in this life of ours. So you will be dead. Allah says, وَإِنَّمَا تُوَفَّوْنَ أُجُورَكُمْ يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ On the day of judgment, everyone will be given his reward. You know, uh, an ajr, you know, yawm al qiyamah, whatever you do, good or bad, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to compensate you. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to let you see that. You know, in the matter of fauna ujurakum yawm al qiyamah, on the day of judgment, everyone will be coming back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to receive his, his reward. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَمَنْ يَعْمَلْ مِثْقَالَ ذَرَةٍ خَيْرًا يَارَهُ وَمَنْ يَعْمَلْ مِثْقَالَ ذَرَةٍ شَرًا يَارَهُ no matter how much small is the righteous deed you are doing, you will see it on the Day of Judgment. And no matter how much small is the evil deed somebody is doing, 
they will witness that on the day of judgment. Every single thing will be documented by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as he says in the hadith al-Qudsi, إِنَّمَا هِيَ أَعْمَالُكُمْ أُخْسِيهَا لَكُمْ ثُمَّ أُوَفِّيكُمْ إِيَّاهَا فَمَنْ وَجَدَ خَيْرًا فَلْيَحْمَدِ اللَّهِ وَمَنْ وَجَدَ غَيْرَ ذَلِكْ فَلَا يَلُومَنَّ إِلَّا نَفْسَهَا Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, These are your deeds. أُخْسِيهَا لَكُمْ You know, I am gathering it, you know, keeping it for all of you. You know, whatever you do, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is recording that, you know, nothing will escape the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know, we are going too far. Let's go back to those people who are initially recording everything. There is nothing that escapes what you're do, what, what you're doing. You know, there is nothing that will escape what you know they're recording. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ma yalfidu min qawlin illa ladayhi raqibun atid. You will never utter a word except that you have the raqib and atid, you know. These are the two angels, each and every one of them has been described by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with raqaba, with raqib, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala called them raqib and atid. Raqib means somebody who is always watching you. And atid is, means somebody who is always with you. you know? Atid means somebody who is always with you. Raqib means somebody who is always uh, watching you. So these two angels are going to be with you all the time to take record of whatever you are doing. So these are the things that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says on the day of judgment, every single person will be given that which he earned in this life. You know, the harvest is going to take place when you meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, not in this life. Although some of us might get the evil consequence of that which they are doing or the good the result of that which they are doing, but the real, you know, uh, havers is going to take place on the day of judgment when we meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَمَنْ زُحْزِهَا عَنِ النَّارِ وَأُدْخِلَ الْجَنَّةَ فَقَدْ فَهَزْ On that day, subhanallah, everyone will be looking for what can help him to pass the test, you know, the real examination, what can help him to pass the test. No, subhanallah. Every single person will be like that. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says a person will be running away from his from his uh, mother, from his brothers, from anyone, you know. Nobody will be agreeing to meet anyone. Everyone will be running away. Because the father is afraid of the son to raise an issue against him. The mother also like that. You know, if you're looking for the day of stinginess, you know, everyone is looking for a single reward that can take him up. This is the day Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, يغني, On that day, every single person will be busy with his own affairs. Nobody will be thinking of another person. It's a very tough day, my dear brothers and sisters. You know. Anything that can cause the mother to throw away her child, you should understand that this is really a tough day. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talk about this day and what will happen on the day of judgment before the decision is been uh, made by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Whatsoever will happen, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala introduced that in the Quran and in the Sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu in a very brief way, which is more than enough for those people who are willing to prepare for that. You need this preparation because the only success on that day lies in that which this ayah mentioned. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَمَنْ زُحْزِحَ عَنِ النَّارِ وَأُدْخِلَ الْجَنَّةَ فَقَدْ فَعَاسِ Whoever is taken away from hell, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, take him away from hell. As the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said in another hadith, he says, فَمَنْ أَحَبَّ أَنْ يُزَحْزَحَ وَجُهُهُ عَنِ النَّارِ وَيُدْخَلَ الْجَنَّةِ Whoever wants Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to take away his face from hell, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala confirmed this in the surah when he says, فَمَنْ زُحْزِهَا عَنِ النَّارِ وَأُدْخِلَ الْجَنَّةَ فَقَدْ فَاسِ If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala take you away from hell and he gets you inside paradise, this is the most successful one. That's why I said success lies in getting this, which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned in this ayah. مَنْ زُحْزِهَا عَنِ النَّارِ وَأُدْخِلَ الْجَنَّةَ فَقَدْ فَاسِ وَمَا الْحَيَاةُ الدُّنْيَا إِلَّا مَتَعُوا الْقُرُوبِ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says this life of this dunya is nothing except the pleasure of 
deception. Hey, wallah, it deceives so many. They think, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala just send them here, you know, to enjoy life, which caused them sometimes to even forget the future life, which is the hereafter. Not just to forget that, there are some of them who actually don't believe in the Day of Judgment to be a reality. Why was that? Because of the wealth. Allah says, يَحْسَبُ أَنَّ مَا لَهُ أَخْلَدَ He thinks that the wealth Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has granted him is going to grant him an everlasting life, you know. He will never die because of that. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talk about those two uh, brothers in Surah Al-Kahf. You know, one of them was telling his brother, he says, وَمَا أَظُنُّ السَّاعَةَ قَائِمًا He said, I don't even think that. I don't even believe that the Day of Judgment. أَظُنُّ هُنَا يعني I don't, is بِمَعْنَ الْيَقِيد it's not shak, you know. He says, I don't even believe that there is the day of judgment, you know. I don't even accept the fact that there is something, you know, which is called day of judgment. And all of these is because of nothing except that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes him rich. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala here says, Woman had to dunya illa That's why in the last part of this surah, Surah Al Imran, now the same surah that this I exist, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says what? He says, Don't you ever be deceived by the, the pleasure and the enjoyment. Taqallub is like up and down. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking about these people being granted the dunya. They have almost everything they need in this dunya. Allah says, don't be deceived by this. Don't you ever be deceived by this. Mata'un qalilu. It is just a simple, you know, enjoyment, which is so insignificant if you compare it with the life of the believers in this dunya and also in the akhirah. Allah says, جهنم, And then at the end of the day, Allah SWT will cast them inside hell. What is the point of life if the end of it is going to be hell? You Allah, whoever says is okay, he doesn't know what hell is all about. Otherwise, when you read the sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu and see what Allah SWT is asking you to make sure that you stay away from it, the hell. You will understand that yes, the ultimate success is to find your face being taken away from, from this place. So dear brothers, this is all about patience and knowing what exactly Allah SWT wants you to do and get busy with that. That's why Allah SWT says after that ayah that I first quoted, <coughs> sorry, Allah SWT says, لَتُبْلَوُنَّ فِي أَمْوَالِكُمْ وَأَنفُسِكُمْ وَلَا تَسْمَعُنَّ مِنَ الَّذِينَ أُوتُوا الْكِتَابَ مِنْ قَبْلِكُمْ وَمِنَ الَّذِينَ أَشْرَكُوا أَذًا كَثِيرًا وَإِنْ تَصْبِرُوا وَتَتَّقُوا فَإِنَّ ذَلِكَ مِنْ عَزْمِ الْأُمُورِ SubhanAllah Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala after he talk about death and the reality of the day of judgment you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says لَتُبْلَوُنَّ فِي أَمْوَالِكُمْ أَنفُسِكُمْ Indirectly Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told us that the success lies in this in a person succeeding in the day of judgment, you know. So he says, لَتُبْلَوُنَّ فِي أَمْوَالِكُمْ وَأَنفُسِكُمْ وَلَا تَسْمَعُنَّ مِنَ الَّذِينَ أُوتُوا الْكِتَابَ مِنْ قَبْلِكُمْ وَمِنَ الَّذِينَ أَشْرَكُوا أَذًا كَثِيرًا Allah says, you're going to be tested in your wealth. You know, you know, subhanAllah, many of us crumble. You know, look at this test that comes to, you know, to the humankind. How many people fail among us? A lot, a lot. And they are still failing, you know, among us. لَتُبْلَوُنَّ فِي أَمْوَالِكُمْ وَأَنفُسِكُمْ you know, you will be tested in your wealth. You will be tested in your soul, in your life, you know. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, not only that, وَلَتَسْمَعُنَّ مِنَ الَّذِينَ أُوتُوا الْكِتَابَ مِنْ قَبْلِكُمْ وَمِنَ الَّذِينَ أَشْرَكُوا أَذًا كَثِيرًا You are going to be deceiving a lot of harm from the children of Israel, the Christians and the Jews. You will be deceiving a lot of harm from them and also the mushrikeen, those people who are idol worshippers. Subhanallah, exactly and precisely what is going on nowadays. Exactly and precisely what is going on nowadays. It happened before and it's still happening nowadays. Who is harmed nowadays? Muslims. Everything Muslim, Muslims, Muslims, Muslims. And the target is not the bad ones, because those ones, they don't care about them. The target is those Muslims, those people who are serious in their religion. You should understand this, you know. Those uh, people who are deviated, they are not threat, you know, they are not considered as a threat, you know, against 
uh, the enemies of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The one that they're focusing on, they are the righteous people, those people who are very serious and dedicated in taking care of their religion. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect the believers. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَمِنَ الَّذِينَ أَشْرَكُوا أَذًا كَثِيرًا وَإِن تَصْبِرُوا وَتَتَّقُوا فَإِنَّ ذَلِكَ مِنْ عَزْمِ الْأُمُورِ you want Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make you amongst the successful one and the, the, the most important people in his eyes, you know, and put you in that high position. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, be patient. That's why he says, if you're patient, this is going to be counted. Uh, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has one of the biggest achievements a person will be having in this life before he meets Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I decided to take us in this simple journey, you know, very simple journey that life doesn't end here. We're going to be facing a heavy, heavy, heavy test on the Day of Judgment. Heavy test. Dear brothers and sisters, I did not mention anything about this day. All of these things that I've mentioned is just like scratch, scratch, scratching the surface, you know. With no exaggeration, it's like, it's like I'm just scratching the surface. If I go deep, you know, inside the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the Sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu subhanAllah, we find things which, uh, subhanAllah, the hair of your body will be standing out when you hear them. You know. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَكَيْفَ تَتَّقُونَ إِنْ كَفَرْتُ يَوْمًا يَجْعَلُ الْوُلْدَانَ شِيبًا How can you protect yourself? How do you think it is possible for you to protect yourself if you are to disbelieve in Allah? How can you protect yourself from the evil and the tragedy of a day that makes a young baby gray-headed? You know. Imagine a tragedy that turns the hair of a baby into white color. We know that, yeah, this happens when a person gets old, but subhanAllah, out of the tragedy, and this is just a statement that came from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to the father of everyone, Adam alayhi salam, you know, and that statement was so difficult to be tolerated and to handle in the way the hair of this person would turn into gray. And whoever has... Uh, yani, uh, whoever was pregnant will discharge everything, you know. SubhanAllah. So I decided to take us through this journey so that we will understand the importance of that which brought us here, which is the Salah. Salah is very important, my dear brothers and sisters. Salah is very important. It is more than enough for you to know its importance when you see the way Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala dealt with it. Jibreel came to the uh, Prophet Sallallahu the first time the Prophet Sallallahu met him, and he met him in, in the cave of Hira. That was the place where Jibreel gave him the first why. That marks the beginning of the change. That was the beginning of what turns the world into the life of uh, uh, justice, you know. After it being in, into the life of darkness, you know, that first, you know, revelation, the five verses Allah Subhanahu Wa gave the Prophet Sallallahu and he marked the beginning of the change in this life. But where did it take place? In the cave of Hira, here on earth. The second revelation which makes the Prophet wasalam, a messenger also took place on earth. The Prophet wasalam, said, Bayna ana amshi fi turuqi al Madid, uh, Makkah. So that was the time I was just walking. That's three months after the first one. You know, he said, I was walking in, in Makkah. You know, I heard somebody speaking on top of me. He said, So I raised up my head to see who is speaking. I found the angel that came and met me in Hira. I saw him sitting on a chair between the heaven and the earth. <laughs> on the air, you can say that. So that's the second meeting. He said, I was very scared of him. I ran away to Khadija, his wife, asking her to cover him as he did in the first time. So this second revelation, which makes the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam a messenger, you know, after that, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam never relaxed in his life. SubhanAllah. Like a machine, you know. That one took place also on earth. Every subsequent revelation was taking place on on earth, regardless of its importance, Allah is to grant the Prophet of some of that revelation on earth. But when it comes to the prayer, 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala invited the Prophet Two angels came to the Prophet When he was in the house of Umahani, they opened the roof of the house. And they went to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Down there, he was between asleep and awake. They opened his chest. They bring the heart. They wash it properly. Filled it with iman. Put it back. Close it. You know. They took him to the burak. The masjid al-haram, the way the burak was there, the animal. They had that longer journey. You know, look at, look at the, the process first. Because he is going to meet the most high. Allah Rabbul Alameen. So they removed the portion of the shaitan from his heart and threw it away. And they closed back the heart. Oh. So they took the Prophet Sallallahu to that journey to the Bayt al-Maqdis. Where Allah Subhanahu wa ta'ala gathered all the prophets of Allah Subhanahu wa ta'ala for him as a welcome reception. He saw all of them, Musa, Isa, Adam, and all of them, you know, SubhanAllah. And he led them in the prayer. He prayed uh, two rakat with them, you know, and he was the Imam, you know, SubhanAllah. Imam al awwalin wal akhirin. The Imam of the first generation includes starting from Adam and the akhir, and the last person to be born until the day of judgment. That is so, you know, to bring them so that he can pray with them, that's more than enough to show to you that this act of worship is really, 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 really important. That's why it is the second Act of worship in terms of importance after the shahadatain. No doubt about this. The second thing after the shahadatain is the prayer. That's why the scholars mentioned that tarku salah, staying away from praying, is worse than zina, worse than uh, taking riba, worse than any other sin you know, you know, apart from shirk. The Prophet passed through that and he said, I met Musa alayhi salam in his grave, and I saw him praying to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He passed Musa, and he saw him praying to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Subhanallah. Kama qala nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, as the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, al-anbiya ufi quburihim yisallun. The messengers of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they are in their graves also praying to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in their graves. What does that tell you, you know? The importance of the prayer, in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala making mandatory upon, upon those prophets, or he asked them, or he advised them, you know. The point is, in their graves, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commanded them also to pray. This is for the prophets. You and I, when we die, it's, it is over. No more. Act of worship after you move back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So you better get it now. So the Prophet sallallahu moved, and Jibreel took him to that an extraordinary journey, you know. SubhanAllah. We're talking about the distance of 3,500 years. Prophet Allah penetrated that in one night. SubhanAllah. Even the, from Bayt al Maqdis to Mecca, we're talking about a month of a journey, a journey of a month, you know. But the Prophet Allah did that within the same night and he moves to the heavens. That one is not amazing when you look at the one in the heavens, you know. He went to the first heaven. He was welcomed by the angels there. SubhanAllah. Very beautiful uh, moment. You know, the time is not, uh, the lecture is not about this, but I just had to introduce uh, the prayer through this hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu the journey. Otherwise, Isra al Miraj is a very beautiful journey. Very, very beautiful journey. I really invite each and every one of you to find the time and go and uh, look for those hadith that talk about Isra al Miraj, you know, and get, you know, a lot of lessons, you know, and things that will increase your iman and help you to hold upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, subhanAllah. So he says, I moved to the first heaven. He met Adam and some other, uh, I mean, so many angels, you know, moved to the second, third, fourth, you know, fifth, uh, heaven number, seven, uh, number six. He met Musa alayhi salam and he went to the heaven number seven, the last one. He met Ibrahim alayhi salam next to the Bayt al Ba'mur, the Kaaba of the angel, uh, I mean, the house that is resembling the Kaaba for the angels. From that moment, Jibreel alayhi salam told him, Ya Rasulullah, hada maqami. He said, Ya Rasulullah, this is the last position I can reach. He had to move alone. Subhanallah. Subhanallah, subhanallah. Even uh, Jibreel alayhi salam couldn't move, you know, 
anymore. That was the last level he can reach, you know. Can you sense that, you know, subhanAllah. The level of the respect that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put on the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, you know. He took him to a place where the closest angel to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the biggest angel in terms of authority, you know, you know, and leadership, you know, subhanAllah. Jibreel couldn't go. He told the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that's the last place I can go, you know. You have to continue going alone. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam moved. He says, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala raised me up. Up to the place where I can hear the sounds of the pens writing the decrees of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Subhanallah. In that place, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed to the Prophet sallallahu He did not see Allah, but Allah spoke to him directly. No barrier of angel. No angel as intermediary or a messenger between Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Rasulullah. Straightforward Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talk about. Uh, I mean, talk to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And that place Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam the prayers. It was 50 first, you know, and even the number, 50 prayers to be prayed on the daily basis, it shows what? Importance that life cannot be, you know, comfortable without having these prayers. Otherwise, why the number is so high? You know? That means, it's, I mean, you really need it, like the way you need your, uh, you need the air for breathing, you know. So the Prophet was so happy to take the prayer, 50 prayers. You know, Allah SWT granted him 50 prayers. He was so happy with that. So he came down. He passed through Ibrahim when he reached Musa. Musa having a lot of experience in Dawah, you know, Ibrahim has, you know, the same experience, if not much sophisticated than Musa. But Musa was dealing with people who have the same mentality as our own people. And some of his people remain until our time, you know. That's why the focus is on him more. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala granted him ability to talk. So he asked Musa, alayhi, I'm sorry, he asked Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, what did your Lord give you? The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said he gave him 50 prayers. And Musa alayhi salam, as you know, he told Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he says, I have faced difficulty and I tried Bani Israel. I live with Bani Israel. And they are stronger than your people in terms of uh, uh, strength and power because they came before the Ummah Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. You know, the size have been decreasing. He said, they couldn't do this. He says, for sure, I have no doubt your Ummah cannot do it. Go and ask Allah Subhanahu wa ta'ala to reduce the size. The Prophet ﷺ kept on going in between Allah SWT and Musa until the time the size became only five. And Musa is still begging the Prophet ﷺ to go and ask Allah SWT to reduce because he's afraid the Ummah of Muhammad cannot do this. So the Prophet ﷺ said, I have been going through between you and Allah SWT, you know, asking Allah SWT to reduce. He says, had to stay He said, I'm very shy to go back to him now. It's only five. They can do it, inshallah. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala spoke to both of them that these are the five prayers and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says and that the word will not change. This is the final statement, you know. The word will not change, you know. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, here khamsun wa hunna khamsun. You know, if there are five in numbers, but in terms of reward, you will get the reward of praying 50 prayers. Not 50 reward. The reward of praying 50 prayers. You know, subhanAllah. That's Fadl, mean Allah Azza wa Jal. So, brothers and sisters, if there is nothing, you know, that is showing importance to this uh, act of worship except this narration, it is more than enough to help the believer to take care of it properly. Abdullah ibn Rasul said, he says, Man arada an yalqallaha musliman, I mean, qadan musliman, he said, whoever wants to meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as a Muslim on the day of judgment, he should make sure that he takes care of this, these prayers. Because they are part of the guidance and the righteousness that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave the Prophet sallallahu And whoever stays away from them, he is staying away from guidance. That's why Abdullah Mas'ud gave us the best example of how to take care of the prayers when he says that 
I have seen, you know, in the time of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, anna ahadana ahadana yuhada bayna rajulay. They'll bring a person, you know, between two people, in the middle of uh, two people, one here and the other one there. He'll be putting his hand on their shoulder, trying to help him to get into the masjid. The man will be very sick, but he will refuse to pray at home. He will ask somebody and beg somebody to come and take him to the masjid so that he can pray with the Prophet sallallahu so He did understand what the prayer is all about. And dear brothers and sisters, this prayer, don't you ever think of it to be a protection, you know, and a success for you in the hereafter alone. No, it is also the means of success in this life. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, إِنَّ الصَّلَاةَ تَنْهَا عَلِ الْفَحْشَاءِ وَالْمُنْكَرِ وَلَا ذِكْرُ اللَّهِ أَكْبَرُ وَاللَّهُ يَعْلَمْ مَا تَسْنَعُ You know, the, the, the thing that and he, uh, destroys a person in uh, the hereafter, and in this life actually first and foremost, are the sins. No calamity that is happening to the life in this, in this world of ours, in this life of ours, calamity that has happened to a person uh, at the individual level or uh, community level, you know, no calamity and musibah that has taken place except because of the sins people are committing, my dear brothers and sisters. Allah says, وَمَا أَصَابَكُمْ مِنْ مُصِيبَةٍ فَبِمَا كَسَبَتْ أَيْدِيكُمْ وَيَعْفُ عَنْ كَثِيرٌ Any musibah that happens in this life to the humankind, it is because of that which we are doing. So if you look, if you look, if you're looking for the source of all evils that are taking place in our life, look at the sins. You know, they are the source of anything that is taking place in this in this life, which is which is evil. Allah says, nothing happens to you of the musibah except it is because of what you what you are. So the more sins we have, the more calamity are taking place in this life, you know. And we can see on the daily basis. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the, in the past says, <coughs> sorry. أَوَلَا يَرَوْنَ أَنَّهُمْ يُفْتَنُونَ فِي كُلِّ عَامٍ مَرَّةً أَوْ مَرَّتَيْنِ ثُمَّ لَا يَتُوبُونَ وَلَهُمْ يَذَّكَّرُونَ I mean, Allah is speaking to the people in the time of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Why can they focus and ponder a bit? They will see that أَنَّهُمْ يُفْتَنُونَ فِي كُلِّ عَامٍ مَرَّةً أَوْ مَرَّتَيْنِ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is testing them every year, once or twice. Subhanallah. He says every year, once or twice. ثُمَّ لَا يَتُبُونَ وَلَهُمْ يَذَّكَّرُونَ But unfortunately, that test that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is bringing was not enough to convince them to repent to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. To understand that something is going wrong in their life so that they can come back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was enough. Whenever I read this ayah, my dear brothers and sisters, I look into our life and say, oh, subhanAllah, in the past days to get the test twice, once or twice in a year. Nowadays, if you are going to listen to the news almost every day, there is a calamity taking place in some part of the earth. Almost every day, there is a musibah taking place. Tsunami, you know, wars, you know, tornado, you know, uh, hurricane, you know earthquake, you know, you know, so many things, you know, so many things are taking, are taking place in our life. Almost every day. We're not talking about once in a year. No, almost every day. Are people repenting to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? No. No, if we are repenting, if we are repenting to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the way it should be that long ago these things could have been taken by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala away from us. We become exactly like the way Allah SWT describes us when He says, We scare them. We bring these natural disasters and calamities and so many things so that they will reflect. But unfortunately, it doesn't increase them in anything except arrogance. This is who we are nowadays. You know. When the eclipse of the sun happens, this is a clear warning from Allah SWT that you guys are going in the wrong direction. But unfortunately, instead of reflection, you know, reflection and going back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and, uh, you know, subhanAllah, praying to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and asking Him to forgive our sins, you know. Instead of doing this, we buy glasses, we come and watch, we scream when it is totally dark, you know. SubhanAllah, what kind of ummah is this, you know? What kind of ummah is this? 
Or can you tell the Prophet you're meeting, you know, the Prophet was so happy when he left this life. And the Ummah is united, the Ummah is in the state of consciousness, but we started going down. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us, but it's a very dangerous thing to be, to be remembered. You know, the people of uh, Nuh alayhi salam, those are the first one, you know. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, uh, we have sent Nuh and also messengers after Nuh. All of those people, all of the ones that Allah wants to talk about, they were destroyed, you know. Why were they destroyed? Because of their sins. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talk about that in the Quran and the Sunnah of the Prophet. The people of uh, uh, Nuh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala destroyed them. He said in uh, uh, Surah to Al Ankabut, He says, they have variety types of sins. So many types of sins, which most likely every single thing that those people were committing, you know, which caused them to get destroyed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, somebody is doing that in the Ummah Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa So Allah says, Each and every one of them, we got them because of their sins. فَمِنُهُمْ مَنْ أَرْسَلْنَا عَلَيْهِ حَاسِبًا some of them we send them a very strong hurricane, you know, wind which carries pebbles in it. Pebbles of punishment is not, it's not just a wind with dust, you know. Punishments like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told the people of Ad, people of uh, Hud, you know. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when they, when, they, when they saw that the clouds coming and the winds, uh, it's, it's, it's heading towards them. They said, هَذَا عَارِذٌ مُمْتِرُنَا SubhanAllah. See how they are in the These are the clouds, you know, and, 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 and the weather that is bringing the mercy of Allah's part of rain. Allah says, No, who am I to ajal to me? Reehun fiha adabun ali. No, it's not like that. This is what you have been telling your prophet who would to bring it now. When he threatened you to be careful, he said, Why not now? <coughs> If you're talking about punishment, why don't you bring it now? Allah says, this is the thing that you're looking for. To dammiru kulla shay'in bi amri rabbiha fa asbahu la yura illa masakinuhum. SubhanAllah. Allah says, the wind came and destroys everything with the command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala fa asbahu la yura illa masakinuhum. SubhanAllah. Life completely seized in that place. I see nothing except houses remain. That's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَبِئِرٍ مُعَطَّلَةٍ وَقَصْرٍ مَشِيكٍ He destroyed the people of the community. Nothing remained in that city except بِئِرٍ مُعَطَّلَةٍ You know, wherever you see a بِئِر life is there. بِئِر means the well. But now it's totally neglected because the inhabitants have been taken by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala away. Away from where? From this life. You see strong castles built by those people. Very strong castle and fortresses. Now nobody is staying in that place, you know. Allah SWT says, وَكَمْ أَهْلَكْنَا مِنْ قَرِيَةٍ بَطْرَتْ مَعِيشَتَهَا فَتِلْكَ مَسَاكِنُهُمْ لَمْ تُسْكَمْ مِنْ بَعْدِهِمْ إِلَّا قَلِيلًا وَكُنَّا نَحْلُ الْوَارِثِينَ SubhanAllah. Allah SWT says, how many times we destroy a nation that was so arrogant, you know. They were so arrogant. They were ext extravagant, you know, in terms of life. They go, they live a very a strong, affluent life, you know. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, because of their bad attitude, He destroyed them all. Allah says, فَتِلْكَ مَسَاكِنُهُمْ لَمْ تُسْكَمْ مِنْ بَعْدِهِمْ إِلَّا قَلِيلًا Those were, their, uh, those were their places of living, you know. لَمْ تُسْكَمْ مِنْ بَعْدِهِمْ إِلَّا قَلِيلًا Nobody lived in those areas except in a few situations. Who is the inheritor of those places? Allah. Allah says, We moved them from existence. Allah SWT says, We took over the place. So He says, Some of them, Allah SWT commanded the angel to shout at them. Life sees completely. You know, you know those, 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 those guys, you know, may Allah protect us. They told their Prophet Salih alayhi salam, the Thamud, 
They, were, they think that they're the strongest nation, you know. They inherited the power and the heritage from Ad, you know, almost the same size, you know. <clears throat> they think everything is okay. They threatened the Prophet Saleh alayhi salam. They even told him, they, they even told him, uh, why, why, why not now? You're talking about punishment uh, uh, to, to come later. You know, we want it now. We cannot accept you except if you bring a sign to us. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Thamudu. Allah gave them the, 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 the camel as a sign. It just emerged just like that. They know that this is the camel from Allah. And subhanAllah, they couldn't bear with the simple condition that Allah SWT laid down for them. You know, when it comes to the feeding. You know, a day for the camel, a day for you, you guys. And it will benefit the whole community. You know. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ibn Ba'ath Ashqaha, the weakest person amongst them, jumped and he went and he killed that animal. You know, in Surah to Hud, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told them, Tamatta'u fi da'alikum thalathat ayyamin dha'alika wa'adun ghayru makdhub. You have only three days to survive, to live, enjoy whatever you want. SubhanAllah, they think it's a joke. After those three days, what happened to them? Just a shout, and it took away the life in that place. You know. Allah says, وَمِنْهُمْ مَنْ أَخَذَتْهُ وَمِنْهُمْ مَنْ خَسَفْنَا بِهِ الْأَرْضِ And some of them, we caused the earth to open and it get down inside, like Qarun. That's why in the same surah, Allah SWT says, وَقَارُونَ وَفِرْعَوْنَ وَهَامَانَ those were the criminals in the time of Musa السلام, the leaders of the criminals. He says, وَمِنْهُمْ مَنْ أَغْرَقْنَا Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, some of them, we caused them to sink and to drown in the, in the sea. Like the people of Lut السلام. I'm sorry, like the people of Nuh السلام. and the people of Lut also as well. People of Nuh السلام, the Tufan came. فَأَخَذَهُمُ الطُّوفَانُ You know, when they're so arrogant, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent his wrath on them. فَفَتَحْنَا أَبْوَابَ السَّمَاءِ بِمَاءٍ مُنْهَمِرٍ The heavens opens completely and خلاص. It was over. So you can see all of those pro, uh, people, you know, that we mentioned, they were destroyed because of what? Because of their sins. That's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَمَا كَانَ اللَّهُ وَمَا كَانَ اللَّهُ لِيَظْلِمَهُمْ وَلَكِنْ كَانُوا أَنفُسَهُمْ يَظْلِمُونَ وَمَا رَبُّكَ بِذَ اللَّهِ مِلِّيَ الْأَبِيدِ Allah says, Allah never wronged them, never oppressed them. وَلَكِنْ أَنفُسَهُمْ كَانُوا يَظْلِمُونَ But they oppressed themselves. What brought them into that kind of tragedy? The sins, my dear brothers and sisters. Wallahi, my dear brothers and sisters, there is nothing that is destroying our life that is worse than the sins. The sins, they are the greatest and the worst type of destruction we're bringing to our life, you know, and the community as well. So the prayer, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, wal-munkar. If you maintain the prayer properly, according to the way the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam asked you to do, sallu kama in the hadith of Malik ibn al if you do that, it restricts you from engaging in those activities that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala hate. The least in terms of the commissions of the sins there, the musalleen. It doesn't go, it doesn't match. You go into the masjid five times in a day, or you standing as a sister at home, praying to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala five times in a day, and at the same time also you are so negligent, it doesn't work. Unless if there is halal in the prayer you're doing. You have this natural security that the prayer is granting you in a way, naturally you will be detesting, you know, and staying away from anything that is shameful or inappropriate. If we stop here, it is more than enough, you know. It helps you, it acts as a deterrent against, you know, a human tendency towards disobedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And also, as human being, you are going to be committing sin from time to time. The prayers act as an expiation. You know. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, As-salawatul khamsu kafaratul lima baynahunna inijtunubatil kabayr. 
You know, when you pray the Zohar time, anything that you have committed from Fajr until this prayer of Zohar, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will remove it from your account. When you pray Asr, the sins being committed between Asr and Zohar will be gone. And there we go. And not only this, my dear brothers and sisters, you make wudu with the Prophet sallallahu said, all the sins you have committed with the hands will be dropping down. You rinse your mouth, the same case. You wash your face, the same case. You know, subhanAllah. When you move out of your house, go into the masjid, you will never raise up your, your leg, your foot, except that Allah SWT will elevate in ranking. When you bring it down, it removes the sins. And there we go, until you reach the masjid, subhanAllah. That's the reason why Bani Salima, when they came to the Prophet Sallallahu and asked his permission to come and stay next to his masjid, the Prophet Sallallahu said, no. Diyarakum tuk tabu atharakum. Diyarakum tuk tabu atharakum. He said, ilzamu diyarakum. You know, stay and remain where you are because your footsteps are written for you, you know, accounted for you. So that's the prayer, you know. It acts as an, as an expiation. You know, for you to remove the sins before you meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And as I said, you know, all of these are benefits that you will be receiving them on the Day of Judgment. And I will be closing, inshallah, with that in the near future. But let's see, does it have any also protection that it does in this life? Yes, it has. It has. When you go through the story of the righteous people, you will see a lot. It really has a strong, you know, uh, protection, you know, for you in this life, physically and spiritually. Daddy, I don't want to go too far. I know all of you are aware of the case of Juraj, Sahibu Bani Israel, one of the monks. You know. His mother visited him in his uh, masjid in the forest. Unfortunately, she found him praying the sunnah, and unfortunately, he did not listen to her call. She was quite old. She has to put her hand on the face to see the place properly, you know. So she, she's coming all the way from the city to him, you know. And she called him. And Juraid understand that. He understood that this is his mother. But unfortunately, she found him praying at that moment. So whenever she called him, he said in his mind, Ya Allah, hadhi salati wa hadhi ummi. Ya Allah, this is my prayer. This is my mother calling me. Which one should I listen to? So he preferred to listen to him, uh, I mean, to continue with, this, with the prayer. And that prayer was a sunnah prayer. That was his mistake. She came for the second time, also did not listen to her. She came for the third time also. Three times his mother is coming, and all the time, anytime she came, she finds him praying, and he will not listen to her. He wasn't disobedient to the, uh, he wasn't a bad child to his parents. But he believes that paying attention to the prayer is more important than paying attention to the, to the, to the, to the mother. You know. Yes, that is correct when you're dealing with the wajib. You pray zuhur and your mother calls you, you don't listen to her. You continue with your prayer. When you finish, you go and apologize and tell her you're praying zuhur. But when you stand up after zuhur prayer to pray the sunnah prayers and then your, your mother or your father calls you, you have to break the prayer and go to them. Because this is sunnah, and listening to the parent is wajib. That was the mistake of Juraj. You know. So the mother was annoyed, and this is also her mistakes. And this mistake is being committed by people of this contemporary era. How many times do you hear a person making a very ugly dua against his child? A lot. And this is wrong, very wrong. You know. This is your child. This is your daughter. This is your son. No matter how much corrupt they are, it's a part of you. You know, what do you benefit if you make dua against them? If you curse them, what do you benefit from that? You know? so instead of asking Allah SWT to guide them, you know, to make them the coolness of your eyes, and then you just sit down and curse and curse and curse and make dua against. And then when something happens to them, the first person to suffer is you. So she made dua against him. She said, Ya Allah, do not take the life of my son Juraj until you get him embarrassed in the presence of the prostitutes. Duraid heard that, you know. So the Banu Israel, you know, look at Banu Israel, you know, even somebody amongst them who is righteous, they don't like that. You think they will accept the Muslims? Even somebody who is righteous among them, they don't like him. 
So they were sitting down meeting, you know, talking about Juraj. How come he is always worshiping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? SubhanAllah. Ibn Atul Malik, you know. That's why Musa called them Sufaha, prodigals. The daughter of the king in that place. She said, I will take care of that. And she was a prostitute to one. She went to him and she she found him praying. She called him. He doesn't want to listen because his mother even called, uh, I mean, came and he did not listen to his mother. For sure, he would not listen to another sister. When she sees that, what did she do? She found out that there is a shepherd who used to come and rest next to the Masjid of Juraj. She went to that person and she submitted herself to him. That person committed zina with her. She became pregnant. She has a child. Right after the child came, she said, this is the son of Juraj. So people are shocked. Juraj? Yeah, Juraj. They came to his uh, masjid. They called him. Juraj was praying. They called. Juraj was praying. So what did they do? They brought him down. They destroyed the masjid. You know, they brought him down and they keep on, they kept on beating him. Juraj did not know what did he do. He was asking them, what did I do? No explanation. At the end of the day, he told them, what did I do? You guys are beating me for what? You know, they pointed at the baby. They said, this baby, where do you get it? Where did you get him? You know, subhanAllah, the first thing that happens after they cool down a bit, you know, and they, they show him the baby, where do you get? We need explanation about this. Juraj, look at the people who are surrounding him. He see, he saw nobody except the prostitutes, you know, the bad people. You know. He remembered the dua of his mother. It's too late, it's too late, you know. Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, be very careful. Be very careful. As children, you should be very careful. As parents also, you should be very careful. The dua of the parent is mustajaba, you know. Especially when they are oppressed. You know. So, Juraj, when he saw that, he remembered the dua. And subhanAllah, he knew that nothing can save him except what? Going back to Allah. Nowadays is what? Going back to the magicians, going back to the psychologists who need also somebody to counsel him, you know? They go back for solution and give them and get what from them, you know? Evil recommendation which will put them into more tragedy than what they were in. SubhanAllah. But Juraj understood that the only way out he has is to go back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the one who sees everything and controls everything. You know? And he understood that the best way to approach Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is when you pray. Brothers and sisters, take this from me. The best way, alal itlaq, you know, with no doubt, the best way to approach Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for a solution is when you pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Especially when you make sujood. Remember the Prophet وسلم, you know, all the prophets of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are running away from the intercession. Rasulullah said, I'm on it. And he went to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and made sujood. You know, the first thing he did, sujood to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he cried a lot. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala really loves sujood. That's why the Prophet وسلم, said, the closest moment you are to Allah is when you prostrate to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the prayer. That's why he says, when you make dua in the sujood, he said, فَقَمِّنُونَ and you سَجَابَ لَكُمْ Definitely Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to listen to your dua. So Juraj told them, please, if you can help, if you can help me to pray to Rakat. They told him, go. They let him go and pray to Rakat. In those two Rakat, he complained to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah knows what is going on. You know, in those two regard, he asked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to interfere. And look at the intervention of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah, did he interfere? Yes. Subhanallah. What happened after that? Juraj, right after the prayer, he came to them. He said, can I have the baby? They gave him the baby. This is a newborn baby, you know. We're talking about the newborn baby. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa explained to us that there are three babies that spoke when they are in the cradle. One of them is this one, Sahib Juraj. So what happened was, Juraj asked them to bring the baby. He took the baby. He hit the stomach of the baby. He said, Ya Ghulam, man abuk. SubhanAllah. He says, boy, who is your father? 
Subhanallah. Look at the yaqeen, you know. Look at the yaqeen that Allah SWT granted him. He said, who is your father? The boy pointed at the shepherd who was there. He says, right, the, the shepherd, you know. And then people were shocked. The baby was talking, you know. They started kissing Juraj and they told him, we're going to build your masjid with gold and all of these things. He said, no, I don't want it. I just want it to be returned back in the way it was before. I made a masjid with the clay. I want it like that. That's it, you know. Those were the real awliya of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But the point I'm looking for in this story is the fact that when he got into trouble, the first thing he remembered is to pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Ibrahim, when they took his wife, that tyrant king and the bad one took his wife, the first thing he did was to pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the wife, when she reached that bad one, also the first thing she did was to pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They understood that the protection in this life lies in praying to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's why Ibrahim did not hesitate to accept the command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to take his children, you know, the best a part of his family, you know, to take them and put them in the way that is no life in that place. That was Mecca. In that time, you know, at that time, there was no life in that place. He says, Ya Allah, I put my family in the place where there is no life in the place. He says, in the Baytik al next to your, uh, your house. He says, Rabbana li kimus salah. He says, Ya Allah, I was doing that so that they can establish the prayer in that place. You know, he says, Rabbana li kimus salah. Ya Allah, I did that so that they can establish the prayer. That's the reason why the Salihin, prayer became, become what? The da'ab. It's like the hobby, you know. Rasulullah said, Ju'ilat qurratu aini fi salah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes the coolness of my eyes in the prayer. I relax when I pray. I got relief when I pray, you know. SubhanAllah. They really enjoy praying, you know. And that can translate also how... Is it possible for the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to stand for how many hours at night? Four, five, six hours, you know, praying to Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala without getting bored of that. Until the time the nature of his feet changes. Why? The nature of the, the feet change, why? Because of long standing. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam will be waiting for tomorrow to come and stand before Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. That's uns. You get that a bad vision, you know. The one they shot with an arrow, you know, he was praying to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he remove it and continue with, with the prayer, you know. Those were the righteous predecessors. I will complete this uh, uh, examples of how prayer is saving a person in this life with the, the hadith of Abu al-Haytham, you know, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, uh, he was hungry one day and he came out and he found Abu Bakr and Roma and he told them, let's go and visit somebody. They go to Abu al-Haytham's house or Abu al-Haytham, you know, they, they, they couldn't find him in the house, but they found his wife, she was there. So she told them, Abu al-Haytham, uh, 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 my husband went to bring to get us some water to drink, you know. It's ta'adhi wulalma. So before the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi left, the man came back, alhamdulillah. So he was so happy, he was so happy, like his his uh, guest was Rasulullah and Abu Bakr and Umar. He was so happy, so happy and excited, you know. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was welcomed by the companion. And then uh, he quickly went inside the house and get them a bunch of tamar. SubhanAllah. From nothing, now they get tamar. And he gave them the water to drink. And he picked up the knife and went in the house very quickly. The Prophet Sallallahu realized that he's going to slaughter something. The Prophet Sallallahu said, please don't slaughter something big, you know. By just three of us. You know? So he slaughtered a sheep. He got them the meat and the water and the tamar, you know. SubhanAllah. Very nice walima. After everything, it's a long story. No, I skipped a lot of it. So the Prophet ﷺ realized that this man doesn't have anyone to support him. You know, he's doing everything alone at home. 
So he said, it looks like you don't have any support in the house, any, any, any maid in the house. He said, yes, Ya Rasulullah, I don't have anyone. The Prophet said, if you hear that I got some, uh, some people, then you come. So he heard that the Prophet got some slaves. So he went to the Prophet and informed him, that, Ya Rasulullah, you promised me to give me uh, somebody to serve me. The Prophet said, yes. So the Prophet said, Alhamdulillah, we have two left. So the Prophet asked him to choose one. So he said, Ya Rasulullah, ikhtarli. You know, very smart, you know. He said, Ya Rasulullah, please choose for me. This need a lesson by itself, you know, a lecture by itself. Trust in the Prophet in all of your affairs, you know. Since we don't live with him nowadays, but we live with the Sunnah. And if this is the case, then we should always contact, contact the Prophet ﷺ through his sunnah. We consult him through his sunnah. So he said, Ikhtardi, Ya Rasulullah. The Prophet ﷺ said, Al-Mustashar Mu'taman. Al-Mustashar is somebody who, whose advice is, uh, I mean, who is consulted by another person. That's Mustashar. Counselor. He said, a counselor is Mu'taman. Mu'taman should act as a trustworthy. And is somebody who is entrusted by the people, and as such, he should be speaking the truth, even if it is against his own policies. As long as you know that this is the truth, he should tell the person who is asking for his advice. The Prophet wasallam told him, There were two slaves there. He said, take this one. Because I saw him praying to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He said, and please be very kind with him. Be very kind to him. So he took the slave and went back home. When he reached home, the wife saw the slave. She said, how did you get, get him? He said, alhamdulillah, this is my case. I told the Prophet sallallahu about his promise. And the Prophet sallallahu asked me to choose this one because he saw him praying. And the Rasulullah asked me to be kind with him. So when the Prophet, when Abu, uh, uh, Abu al-Haythama told her this, you know, subhanAllah, that's the benefit of getting a company that is righteous and good, you know. So she told him, you will never reach the peak of acceptance, you know, and taking the advice of Rasulullah except if you free him. SubhanAllah. Right after she told him this, he looked at that slave and told him, you know, He was looking for somebody to help him in the house. But subhanAllah, he ended up freeing the man, you know, and he has, he has nothing, he doesn't care. Why was that? Because Rasulullah asked him to be very kind to him. And why did the Prophet ask him to be very kind? Because he was praying to Allah. My dear brothers and sisters, you can see how the prayer is saving a person in this life from the slavery. And inshallah, it will save him also in the hereafter. If he maintains his attitude. So brothers and sisters, there are a lot to be said concerning this matter. A lot and a lot. But I did not in intend to go beyond an hour. And I guess now it's more than one hour. It, you know, we have been speaking. So I will close with this hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu that I started my speech with it, where the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, the first thing that you will be questioned by Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala about is the prayer. If the prayer is perfect, you definitely succeed. And if the prayer is not perfect, the, per the person fails. And that will be the thing that will take place on the Day of Judgment. Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala will ask the angel to check the book of your record to see... <coughs> Sorry whether you pray or not. And if you pray, whether the prayer is complete or not. So the Prophet said, if the prayer is okay, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will ask them to close the book and take you to paradise. I believe this is the ultimate success. And this is the meaning of hisab and yasira. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will have the simple hisab for you, which is the ard. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala after this will take you and have a special discussion between you and him and take you to paradise after that. You know, that day is going to be seen as 50,000 years long, but for the righteous people and the musalleen, it's going to be just like the, 
the, the, the duration between Zuhur and Asr. As the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Yawm al-Jumu'ah ala al-Mu'minin ka qadr ma bayna salat al-Zuhur al-Asr. For the believers, the Day of Judgment is going to be just like the, the duration between Zuhur and Asr. Imagine because of your prayer, you're going to see this. Prayer is one of the reasons why you see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the Day of Judgment. That's why the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said when they asked him about the possibility of seeing Allah, he said, you will definitely see him and nobody will be asking his friend to move so that he can see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because you will see him just like the way you see the moon, Laylat al-Badr, when it is completely circle. And then he says, you're going to see Allah on the Day of Judgment and if you can be able not to miss a prayer that is before uh, sunrise and the prayer before the, uh, the sunset, you should do. He's speaking about Asaran and the Fajr. Asaran and the Fajr. What is the connection? You know, he was talking about seeing Allah. He said, you will be seeing Allah. And therefore, if you can be able not to miss a Fajr prayer and the Asr prayer, you should definitely do that. It's one of the causes of seeing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. One of the reasons and asbab of seeing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the day of judgment is to maintain your prayers. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said, if the prayer is complete, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will take the person to paradise. The rest of the sins will be gone. Insha'Allah. And if the prayer is incomplete, then Allah will ask them to check and see from the sunnah. If you have any sunnah, and that's the importance of the sunnah, prayers, my dear brothers and sisters. It's very dangerous to live a life without praying the sunnah. Because if you have deficiency, which I do believe, we're going to go back with deficiency in our prayers. Look at our prayers nowadays. If the previous nation, they have deficiency in their prayers, you know, because we are human beings. What do you think of the prayer nowadays? Which people are very negligent. And as Malik says, I couldn't see anything which has been preserved, you know, from the time of the Prophet ﷺ, that everyone is preserving nowadays, you know, except the prayer. And you started neglecting the prayer also as well. That was Anas in his time. I don't know what would he say if he come to our time. So if you have Sunnah prayers, Allah will take from the Sunnah prayers to complete the deficiency you have in the wajibat. And then the same thing, a person will be taken to paradise. Be in But if the prayer is incomplete, and also there is no sunnah to complete it, this is when the real tragedy is going to begin. Because every single detail is going to be checked in your book. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, uh, I mean, the, 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 he's going to, uh, uh, I'm sorry, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, uh, uh, he says, Man nukish al hisaba uzzib. Yeah, that's the hadith I'm looking for. Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Man nukish al hisaba uzzib. If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is to observe the reckoning, the real hisab, you know, for you, you will definitely be in trouble. So to avoid this complication, this trouble, you know, and this tragedy from taking place on the day of judgment is to pray in this life. If you pray bi idhnillahi azza wa the hisab will be so simple and easy as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned. But if you don't pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the hisab is going to be so subtle, so accurate, you know, subhanAllah. Every single thing is going to be, to be touched. You know. How can you say, how can you survive, you know? How can you save yourself? You know? So my dear brothers and sisters, I guess this is more than enough for us to uh, revisit our attitude, you know, and think properly. If you have negligence, you know, stop being negligent. Life is not a joke. And soon we will be living this life. Look at what is going on nowadays, you know, which confirmed to us that we are really, really living in the end of time, you know. So I really advise each and every one of us to think properly, to understand the reality of life and the objective of life, and always try to build a good relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which will, inshallah, earn you a good position with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the day of judgment. With that, my dear brothers and sisters, I think I shall stop here. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant you good and tawfiq in life. In the Kulli Jameel and Kafir. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdika. Shara la ilaha illa anta. Astaghfirullah to be alaik. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum assalamu wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Jazakumullah khairan ya sheikh. Ameen wa zayr. Ameen wa zayr. Do we have time for questions ya sheikh? Insha'Allah. <laughs> The first question is asking a sheikh, can we join the first two Rawate prayers before Dhuhr into one? 
So we pray for raka with one taslim at the end. Yeah, that's some scholars have mentioned that most of the scholars are saying that the night and the day prayers they are supposed to be prayed uh, twice, uh, two to rakat. Salatul Layl, one nahar mathna mathna. Uh, and a narration says Salatul Layl mathna mathna. Another narration says Salatul Layl one nahar mathna mathna means two two two. The best is to avoid this co controversy of the scholars and pray two rakat and pray another two rakat. But if a person prays four rakat continuously without any sitting except in the last one. Uh, out of uh, following that uh, opinion of some scholars, that would be okay, inshallah. But I will always prefer staying away from controversy. Get it? And it is more rewardable for you because when you pray, you're going to have tashahud and taslim. These are additional rewards. You know, the person who prayed only, uh, uh, who prayed for a card with one tashahud will get a, the reward of one tashahud. You get it? So you're being on the safe side and also at the same time, you get more reward. The last one until I grant is good. Okay. Next question says, does salah become invalid when a part of a female's aura shows for a short time? Example, here comes out part of the arm shows when raising the hands. Uh, if she does it intentionally, it will, it will, it will break her prayer. But when uh, it happens accidentally, all that she has to do is to cover it. Okay? That's it. Mm. Inshallah. And if she doesn't know that some part of her is uncovered, and that was not based on negligence, she tried her best to wear the proper dress, but some part of her is not covered properly, and she, she wasn't aware of that. It doesn't affect her prayer. The prayer is okay, inshallah. I'm very curious about how to make salah not mundane. I feel that when salah is repeated many times, I find that my mind or mouth will be distracted, because of the repetitive actions, is there any advice that you can give to prevent this or ways to gain focus? Uh, no, it shouldn't it shouldn't act like that. You know, look at the look at the communities where they mention they make the religion just once in a time, you know. For a purpose of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make it like that, and he did not put them all together at once. And subhanAllah is not repetition, you know, different types of prayers. You know, even the name is different. You know, Allah SWT has given them. And also, you see different ways of praying. Fajr is two rakat, and the Asr and Dhuhr, these are four rakat, Isha is four rakat. This one is, you, you raise with your voice, this one is three rakat, this one you make it silent. You know, the name is different, you know, and the, the way you are praying, although resemble the same thing, but you should know and always understand that having connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala every single moment of your life is the thing that saves you in this life. Actually, it's a favor. You know, if you try, if you understand the one that you're meeting in the prayer, well, you will look for more. Rasulullah was looking for more. Musa was not asking him to go and look for a decrease because it is too much. No, uh, I'm sorry, because uh, you shouldn't go to Allah SWT all the time, but because he was just afraid of people not being able to do it. And nowadays you find some people, even five uh, times in a day, do you think it is, so, I mean, it is an exaggeration, extremism, you know, to pray five times in a day to get an idea. So if you understand the purpose and the one that you are meeting in the prayer, imagine, you know, uh, a person meeting the, the one that he loves, you know, we don't get bored usually, you know. To get an idea, you're going to meet a king. The king is inviting you from time to time. You don't get bored. But this is the creator of everything. You are meeting him in the prayer and five times in a day. This is really a privilege. You know, so if you understand this objective, be the light Allah, it will be helping you to remove that kind of a thought, you know, that is in your mind that repeating something, you know, takes uh, away the, the importance or will cause a person to get bored. It, it shouldn't act in this way. So read a lot about the prayer. This is my advice. Uh, study. Join classes where uh, you will learn about the religion more and more and more and more. And inshallah, as I said, you will find it actually, uh, you will look for more. You know, Why those people, not just praying five times in a day, but they pray at night, you know. They believe that, you know, uh, like one of them said, when he was about to die, they, they asked him, why are you crying? He says, the reason why I'm crying is that I am go going to lose that enjoyment I used to have at night when I pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. To get an idea. So they do understand that this is a meeting between them and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The most important moment in their life is this. 
That's why they wait for it. That's why their heart is always connected to the masjid so that they can come and, and, and stand in that uh, state of humbleness, reflect upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So look at it like this, be the light, it helps, inshallah, to stay away from those type of thoughts. Someone keeps forgetting how many rakahs they prayed despite trying very hard to focus and remember. How can they overcome hmm. this? Uh, it's, it's, oh, sorry, if you can say it again, inshallah. Someone keeps forgetting how many rakahs they prayed despite trying very hard to focus and remember. How can they overcome hmm. this? Uh, they should try, you know, when they come to pray, try their best, you know, to make sure that they come before the time and pray some sunnah uh, prayers before the worship. It helps them to be fresh, you know, and remove anything that can distract them. Good idea. And this doubt that they are having, it should be a reality. You know, it should be a reality, not based on a thought, you know. Uh, if it is assumption, they shouldn't pay attention to it. If it is based on assumption, they shouldn't pay attention to it. Good idea. The Prophet Sallallahu gave us a way out. And this uh, type of attitude is very dangerous because once you submit to the doubt, it keeps increasing. You know. At the end of the day, you will find yourself very difficult to be firm on anything. You know. Whatever you do, you're going to have doubt in it. Whatever you do, you're going to have doubt in it. So my advice is to come to the prayer on time or before the time, you know, and pray some sunnah prayers and relax and read some Quran and make some dhikr. Once you start, uh, stand up to start praying, you know, uh, make sure that you focus, you know, and that's why if the questioner is, uh, is a male, I really advise you not to miss prayer in the masjid. So pray with the imam, you know, you are following the imam. So in this case, you will never forget anything because you are following the imam, you know, uh, there is no way for the imam to be doing something and you're doing something else, you know. But as I said, it's very important to understand the kind of doubt you're having. If it is not, you know, strong, you have to st uh, stay away from it and just focus in your in your prayer. Uh, but as I said also, come uh, to the prayer on time, you know, before the time actually, pray some sunnah prayers. It helps you to make your brain fresh, inshallah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant you good and tawfiq. Mm -hmm. And once that happens, if the doubt is 50-50, uh, whereby you cannot make a preference, uh, in this case, you take the less amount. But as I said, it shouldn't be all the time. When it is all the time, every time you are like this, then this is the time for you not to pay attention to the doubt anymore. Because most likely you are praying correct, correctly, but shaitan doesn't want you to relax. You get it? But if it is, I mean, once maybe after a month, you know, uh, in this case, the way to fix it, if the doubt is 50-50, you cannot make a preference, then you take the lesser amount. You don't know whether it is two or one, you take one. You complete your prayer after you finish, you make sujud as uh, before the salam. But sometimes the doubt is something that could be uh, avoided, you know, but whereby you can make a preference. You can, you can have the vast majority of your thoughts to favor one of the amounts. You don't know whether it is two or one. But according to the vast majority of your thought is that you pray two rakat. Uh, so you go with that. Or according to the vast majority of your thought, you pray only one rakah. You go with that. If you can make preference, in this case, the sujood is should be after the salah. The sujood is should be after the salah. May Allah grant you and all of us to feed. Okay. I'll add this question since it's related. What if someone forgets a sajda within the sujood is So he only makes one sujood, a sahu instead of two. What should be done in that case? <laughs> <laughs> if he is if he is married or she is married i will ask <laughs> them what happens at home you know <laughs> yeah, so, a lot. so in this case he comes back and make the sujood it depends on where where is he in the same uh, he made one sujood and then he remember that he made actually only once he started making that i mean he made one sujood and, uh, and then he said, Salam. Or if he's taking the madhab that says you have to make the shahud again, while he was making the shahud, and then he remembered that, oh, he made only one sujood. In this case, he just do the second one, and the case will be 
will be closed. Yeah, but if you have already said the salam, uh, the best is to just make the two sujood and you know, all all of them once again, and then, and then at the same time make the two sujood once again, and then say the salam, and that's it, inshallah. And next time we tell him try come to the prayer, uh, empty minded. <laughs> The next question says, what is the basics of prayer that everyone should know, especially for children who now need to pray, but aren't capable of memorizing all of the duras quickly? Uh, the basics were well, the, the, uh, the, the thing that the Prophet Sallallahu taught Khalad bin Rafi. Go and check the hadith of Musih Salatihi. You know, uh, any place where you can get the, the full version of that hadith, you know, Musih Salati, I think uh, in the Subul Salam, he did an excellent job. Sheikh Nasir Deen, also in Tifat Salat Nabi, also did an excellent job in com combining what the Prophet Sallallahu said in that hadith. These are a minimum. You know, the kid to know the arkan of the prayer, to have Surah Al Fatiha be memorized, to memorize uh, some surahs, you know, at least those three surahs, the last one, or the ten surahs, you know, giving them something very simple. And the dua. Subhan Rabbi al -Azim. This one doesn't take any time. You can teach any 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 child. Subhan Rabbi al -Ala. You know, Rabbi Firli. Rabbi Firli, Warhamni, Waafini. Until the end of the dua. And also to learn the tajahud. You know, you teach them tajahud. Slowly, slowly, according to their age. To teach them until they learn. You know, uh, and also the, uh, apart from the tajahud, the takbirat, how to move here and how to move there. Those basic things in the prayer, you know. The only thing that will skip is the the dua they will be making for themselves, you know. That one might be uh, quite long. So you start with this first and focus on it. And slowly, slowly, gradually you teach them. And one of the best method is that you pray with them all the time. And as a father, as a mother, when you pray with them, sometimes you raise up your voice with these al Kids are very smart and their brain is very sharp. You know, they remember, they remember, and they memorize. To get an idea, it's a very excellent way of teaching. When you in the prayer, sometimes you raise up your voice. They know that you're reading Fatiha, especially when the prayer is Dhuhr or Asr. You know, uh, you don't raise up your voice usually, but if you're praying with your children, you should raise up your voice. Sometimes, you know, with some of the the the, the, the recitation. You know, for instance, I pray next to my child. I'm praying Dhuhr. Instead of uh, praying very silent, silently in the way I, I move my my lips only, I pray like this. Alhamdulillah, Ya Rabbil Alameen, Ar-Rahman, Ar-Rahim. You know, next to me, my child can listen. Uh, yeah, at this moment, I'm reading Surah Al-Fatiha. To get an idea. Even if I don't go until the end of it, but I, I go to a certain extent. When I go to the sujood, when I do the dua in the sujood, I raise up my voice for, the, for them to hear that this is the place of uh, Subhan Rabbi Al-A'la. Subhan Rabbi al When I make ruku, you know, I raise up my voice with the dhikr inside. You know, this, inshallah, the first prayer, second prayer, third prayer, you will find them memorizing uh, the, 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 the requirement, you know, inshallah. Hmm. This question says, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Many places in the Quran, it is mentioned together, wa aqimu salata wa atu zakat. Is there a specific wisdom we can learn from this? A lot, you know. And, and first of all, the Sharia of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is like that. And that's why, uh, uh, I mean, Abu Bakr and the rest of the companion, they understand the importance of the, of the zakah being connected to the prayer. That's why Abu Bakr who told them, Wallahi, whoever separated between the prayer and the zakah, I'm going to fight him for that. That was the right of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is also the right of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to be given to those people whom Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala assigned for. To get ideas. So it's not about just ibadah, it's about also community engagement. You know, you just do the ibadah, but after that you should remember that you are supposed to be productive in benefiting the community. From that which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala granted you, you're supposed to share, you're supposed to help, support, you know, to, to cooperate with people. You know, it's very nice and excellent system, you know, uh, that helps you to understand that life is not always in the masjid. Because the prayers is supposed to be done in the masjid or at home for the sisters if they don't want to go to the, to the masjid. This is not only uh, the only thing that exists in the religion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So having the zakah being connected to the prayer can tell you that both are needed. To get an idea. 
uh, you do the right of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and also take the right of uh, the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and give it uh, to them in the way Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala prescribed. Yes, Uzayah. We have a follow-up question from the previous ones. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, Shaykh. Back to unintention aura opening during salah. If someone informed us that our aura opened unintentionally during salah, is it correct, or is there no need to repeat the salah early? Ah, uh, they don't need to repeat it. They should just uh, try to cover it at, at the moment somebody is informing them, and that person also should help. Let's say the husband came back and he found his wife praying, but some part of her is exposed, which is which shouldn't be exposed. Uh, she she he should help in this. Go and get her hijab, the other hijab, and put on the place and talk to her. Tell her that your hair is showing, uh, this and that. She can put it down. Uh, if, let's say, the feet is showing, uh, it doesn't get to uh, be covered uh, correct, uh, properly, put some cloth on it. You know, He can help them to bring the cloth and put on it. You know, That will be okay if Eden Allah has Zawajal, inshallah. They don't need to repeat the prayer. That's why... That's why in the prayer, even if you have the, let's say, uh, a woman is taking a child and the baby peed on her, how must she do? Repeat the prayer. No. The scholar said if she can remove the cloth which is affected by the urine and the balance of the cloth that remains on her is sufficiently enough to cover the aura, then she just remove that one and throw it away. To get an idea and continue with her prayers. So if she's praying with the husband, let's say if she removes that one, you know, the husband can give her another one to put and remove that one. It's like Allah can save the, the prayer rather than starting initiating initiate the prayer from, from the beginning. Someone wants to teach salah to children online. Can they use pictures of people with their eyes crossed out in the different prayer positions to teach kids? Yeah, the one that they shade the face, right? Yes. Uh, that, that's fine, inshallah. Okay. Like, how many more questions can we take, Yashir? Yeah, we have quite a few. Take, inshallah. Until I tell you, stop. Not in how you guys, your lecture comes, alhamdulillah, in the way I want. You know, we take time sometimes one year, you know, a few months. So, no problem. Let people ask. <laughs> 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 if we are praying the loud prayers, such as Fajr, Maghrib, and Isha, behind the Imam, do we hmm. read Al Fatiha with the Imam in the first two rakah? Or keep silent and then read it after the Imam. Uh, you wait until the Imam read first. You keep silent when the Imam is reading Fatiha. After he says Well Bali, you say Amin with him, then you quickly read your Surah Al Fatiha. Yeah, that's how it is. You don't read with him. <laughs> what should one do if they haven't finished reciting Al Fatiha and the Imam goes to Rukur and is almost finishing? It depends on the situation. If let's say, as he said, it's almost finishing, he finishes first and then join the and then join the Imam in the ruku. If the the person joined the prayer from the beginning and the Imam uh, finished the fatiha and he doesn't finish, he has to finish and then he joins the Imam. And this person this person is blamed because what was he doing you know, in the prayer until the time Imam finishes his fatiha. But if a person joined in a time which is not enough actually to finish the Surah Al-Fatiha, he started, then the Imam bow for the Ruku, he has to stop anything and go for the Ruku. You get an idea. So the only problem is the, uh, with the person who is there with the Imam from the beginning, you know, and he did not finish the Surah Al-Fatiha. What was he doing? So that's why our recitation of Surah Al-Fatiha should be very quick when you're with the Imam so that you will not get into this trouble. What people are doing nowadays to see the person remaining in the prayer, the Imam is in the Ruku, and sometimes the Imam goes to even Sujood, he's still trying to finish Surah Al-Fatiha. I don't know which Fatiha is you reading. You know. That's wrong practice. You get an idea, but somebody who has, I mean, only a few uh, uh, I mean, words left, you know, he should wait and finish first and then join the Imam in the, in the Ruku. Okay. That takes how many seconds? Two, three, four, five seconds? You know, inshallah. There's only a few minutes left of Fajr, and the person is afraid of missing prayer. So he takes wudu quickly and prays despite needing to use the bathroom. Is his prayer valid? 
Or what type of use in ba the bathroom? Just uh, maybe you read Akramakumullah or the other one. Yeah, the prayer is valid according to the vast majority of the scholars. And actually, everyone should accept this, you know, because the, 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 the condition of the time is taking the preference more than any other condition. You know, what he did was absolutely right. If you, if you stand up and you need to use the bathroom, as long as the need is not that strong in the way it prevents you from practicing the, uh, the, waj, uh, the, the rukun. Let's say you cannot make sujood, you cannot stand, you know, uh, then in this case you cannot pray. You have to go and relieve yourself and then come back again. So what he should do is a person should go to the bathroom and just quickly relieve himself, uh, clean himself and come and make the tembo. You know, if he if he thinks that making wudu will uh, get the time out, then he makes the time and come and pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You get an idea. So when a person uh, wakes up and he needs a bathroom, you know, but, but it is not that much strong need, uh, the best, if he knows that if he uses the bathroom, the prayer time will go will be gone, he should just go and make wudu very quickly and pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. After that, then go and use the bathroom. There's a similar question to this. It says there's a few minutes left. Should the person prioritize the sunnah prayer for fajr or should he pray the fajr? Uh, he should pray for the, uh, go for the fajr first. Sunnah prayer should come afterwards. Let's say you wake up, you have only five minutes left. Okay. Uh, five minutes, inshallah, can pray. If you know that you can pray the sunnah prayers very quickly, read only Surah Al Fatiha and pray very quickly. In the sujood and rukur, just Subhan Rabbi Al Azim, and then you go. In the way, inshallah, two minutes you'll be done with the sunnah, uh, sunnah prayer. You know, uh, not uh, very quickly, you know, like touch and go. No, you pray calmly, but very quick. You know, if you know that you can have, let's say, at least two minutes. Because what we want is, when you come for the Fajr prayer, you finish the whole uh, first rakah. The first rakah, you finish it all. You know, when you can, uh, you can finish the, uh, the two sujood of the first rakah, then you got the time. The second rakah, even if uh, if the time already go, uh, gone out, it doesn't affect your prayer at all. But if you are afraid of missing the time, if you pray the sunnah, the the wajib, not just the best, it is wajib for you to begin with the wajib prayer first, and then later on you come and pray the sunnah prayers. <coughs> the only person that the only person that maintained the arrangement is somebody who missed the time already. You woke up and you found out that the sun already risen. You woke up at 8, for instance. Khalas, finish, you know, uh, the time long ago. So in this case, when you pray, you pray the sunnah prayers first, and then you pray the wajib, because the time is already gone. And for you, Allah SWT gave you that time to pray the wajib. It's like you're praying on time. So you start with the sunnah prayer. As the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the same scenario happened to him, and he prayed the sunnah first, and then, the watching. Mm. Brother has a follow up question. Is it true that if one wakes up late for Fajr and the sun is about to rise, he should still pray the Sunnah prayer, even if the sun rises by the time he's done with the Sunnah prayer? Uh, no. He has to go for the Fajr prayer. He has to stay away from the Sunnah prayer and go for the Fajr prayer immediately. Mm. <coughs> <coughs> <laughs> Chef, can you please explain the shortening and combining prayers when traveling to do them together or is only shortening preferable? Uh, to do them together, shortening and combining, right? Yeah. Yeah, whenever you are allowed Islamically to shorten your prayer, combining the prayer also is permissible. If you are allowed to shorten, combining also is, is permissible. Read in Allah so the point is, when are you allowed to, to shorten? So when you travel, when you have a journey, what is called a journey culturally, that means you are making a preparation which is uh, not normal. You know, I'm going to KL, from going back to KL, I don't, I don't make any preparation because even if my car got something, I can walk and come back home. But I go to Srambang, you know, I go to Malacca, to another state, you know. I go to another country, I go to uh, Saudi Arabia, Pakistan, I go to any other country, you know. You know, uh, I make extra preparation. This is what we call journey. And as such, you are uh, given the right to shorten the prayer and also to combine Dhuhr and Asr and Maghrib and Isha. You get it? So, uh, as I said, 
when whenever you can do the qasr you can shorten com combination also of the prayers dhuhr and asr or maghrib and isha is it's okay inshallah is it permissible to watch videos where people go into abandoned houses and try to capture paranormal activities like abandoned houses and try to capture Paranormal activities. What is paranormal activity? That's uh, jinn's activities. Yes, or? yes, yes. <laughs> Tell them uh, 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 Islamic society has the halakat li tahfiz al Quran. <laughs> it's absolutely waste of time. You know, it's absolutely waste of time. Anyway, watch videos that are educational. You know, even if it is. Any friend, no problem, inshallah. As long as those videos are uh, showing something that is halal, but those people are wasting their time, you know, and it's also wrong thing to be done, you know. Wrong thing to be done. You know, those type of things they're not supposed to be shown to the kids. Yeah, it's supposed to be shown to the kids. That kind of life we should live in the way Allah SWT left it and go into the house, you know, uh, what do they call it? Hunted houses? Abandoned houses, yeah. And also haunted, yes, haunted houses, yes. Yeah, yeah, I hid my kids in haunted houses. So, <laughs> so, 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 so that's a waste of time. You know, it's okay to watch any video, even if it is not showing the religious activities, but something halal is is okay. But those type of things, I take them as a waste of time. And as a Muslim, also anything that doesn't bring you uh, closer to the akhirah and benefit your akhirah, staying away from it is. Zod, inshallah. But at the same time, as I said, uh, watching events which are halal events, you know, even if you don't get any akhirah benefit, it's fine, inshallah. This, inshallah, is the second last question, Shaykh. Okay. If a sister got her menses before she got to pray, Vohar came in and she got her menses before she prayed it, can she make up the sunnah and the full prayer once she is pure? Yeah, if she was, inshallah. She has to make the make up the wajib because the time for that prayer already arrived before the menses comes. So if, let's say, the menses, menses comes five minutes, you know, uh, five minutes uh, after the existence of the time, after the entrance of the time, then she has to make up that prayer, that Zohar prayer, alone. She doesn't need to make up uh, any other prayer. That prayer that she uh, uh, catch up, she has to make up that prayer. And anyway, some scholars were saying that if she catch Asr all the time, then she has to make up Zuhr also. So that's all a statement with no evidence. Uh, uh, the only prayer she should uh, be making up is the prayer that she, she missed. So she wants to make up also the Sunnah prayer, is okay, according to the opinion that says it's okay to make up Sunnah prayers. Inshallah, it's okay. Mm -hmm. What is the best way for a wife to remind her husband for praying in the mosque? What should be done if he is not listening to her? Rather, it is creating an argument with the wife being accused of not reminding properly, rather being irritating. Will she be a sinner if she stopped reminding her husband, although she feels really saddened and angry about neglected prayers in the masjid? She should think and study the way she is reminded. Mostly, if a wife fail to <laughs> to convince the husband, <laughs> yeah, the, unless if the husband is, is somebody, you know, mostly sisters, they have their own ways, which inshallah, if they use it properly, the husband will get convinced, and he will do. So sometimes what is going on is getting angry, you know, getting annoyed, getting angry, you know. And the husband might be taking another opinion that says uh, praying in the masjid is not wajib. You have many scholars, many, many scholars, actually, not just a simple amount, who believe that going to the masjid is not wajib. It's sunnah. Although this is incorrect, but there are many scholars, big scholars, actually, who will tell you that it's not wajib. You know. So he's following that, maybe. You know, that wife needs a strong you know, a methodology full of wisdom. She always maintain her smile. Kindness, you know, gentleness in terms of uh, speaking, leniency, you know, and this, to, to use any any method, you know, 
maybe you find it very difficult. I'm ready to, to accompany you. She should say to him, let me go to the masjid, me and you, let's go. Even if she's not praying you know, at that time, I will accompany you to the masjid, I'll wait for you in the car. Or I will just wait for you out of the masjid. When you finish, you come out, let's go. You know, do everything possible, but I really advise her to maintain her smiles whenever she approaches the husband. This is really important. Uh, this is really important. Once she try to uh, to talk with an angry face, then uh, you know this is a husband. He believes even culturally and naturally he is a leader in the house. And why is she doing this? You know, although she's not a slave, she's a partner in living. You know, but there is always a better way to convey a message. You know, there is always a better way to convey a message. And my advice is, whenever you fail to convey the message and somebody is very aggressive, you know, to you. And especially, uh, especially as it is mentioned in the question, I guess that he is saying that the method is wrong. You know, to get an idea. So the first thing you should do is to question your methodology. What am I doing? How am I doing it? You know, no, Alayhi Salam was inviting them in the night. It doesn't work. In the daytime, it doesn't work. He changed. You know, all of these are telling you that yes, somebody is trying to find the best way to approach a person. Because the idea is you want him to go to the masjid, you know. So at the same time, you should always think of how to approach him in a better, in a better way, inshallah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us tawfiq and uh, inshallah, you will see a day whereby he will not pray at home at all. He will always go to the masjid. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us to see the end of this pandemic so that masjid will come back in the way of the hour. They will. That's the end, inshallah, Sheikh. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Uzair, and uh, all the team, inshallah, uh, from the brothers and the sisters' side. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant you Firdaus and combine all of us in Firdaus and Allah and grant you a good life and make all of you happy. I'm really, I really appreciate I enjoy uh, being in the presence of Nottingham uh, students. I don't I want to mention anything, but I really love you guys uh, for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to be the witness of this and uh, to make me that person who loves you for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and make us all among those uh, people whom he, he loves. Innahu bi kulli jameelin kafir. Inshallah, see you in the next uh, invitation. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdik ashara la ilaha illa ant astaghfiruka wa tubi ilaik. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. Thank <laughs> you.